night of April 18, 2020, Portapik, Nova Scotia, a village of about 100 residents on the Bay of Fundy, became the starting point of what would become a shooting rampage. It would last more than 13 hours, spanning across a more than 100 kilometer area with victims' bodies strewn across 16 crime scenes. By analyzing RCMP statements, interviews, GPS coordinates, and records, we were able to paint perhaps the most comprehensive picture to date of how the worst mass shooting in Canadian history unfolded. We confirm with several sources that prior to 10 p.m., gunman Gabriel Wartman allegedly assaults and ties up his longtime girlfriend in Portapique, 40 kilometers west of the small town of Truro, after leaving a party. At an unknown time, she escapes and hides in the woods. Police receive a 911 call about a shooting in rural Portapique. 25 minutes later, officers arrive on scene and find bodies on the road and buildings on fire. So there's a structure fire. Uh, there's a person down there with a gun. Uh, they're still looking for him. The patient we have got shot by him. He was uh, uh, just down there observing the fire, checking out the fire. So there could be other patients around the fire that could be gone already. According to property records we obtained, Jamie and Greg Blair, Peter and Joy Bond, Corey Ellison, Lisa McCulley, Jolene Oliver, Aaron Tuck, and their daughter, 17-year-old Emily Tuck, Don Madsen, and Frank Gulichin, Elizabeth Joan Thomas, and John Zhao. The devastation there is, has been described as a war zone uh, by people that I speak to that have been in there. The devastation that's there is just uh, catastrophic. At 10.35 p.m., a witness sees a vehicle believed to be the gunman's leaving Portapique through a field. At this point, police believe the gunman is in a replica RCMP cruiser. The gunman was uh, a bit obsessed with policing. He was a collector of police memorabilia and paraphernalia. The gunman then heads east and arrives in an industrial area in the community of DeBert, about 26 kilometers from the scene of the first shootings. At 11.32 p.m., Nova Scotia RCMP announced on Twitter they are responding to a firearms complaint in Portapique and ask people to avoid the area and lock their doors. RCMP issued no public alert or additional statement on Twitter for eight hours. What the gunman did overnight remains unknown. At the crack of dawn, the gunman leaves DeBert and travels north along Highway 4. He is captured on video entering the Wentworth area, roughly 60 kilometers north of Portapique. He heads to a home on Hunter Road, where he kills two men and a woman, believed to be Alana Jenkins, Sean McLeod, and their neighbor, Tom Bagley. He remains at the victim's home for some time, according to police. Around the same time, his common-law spouse comes out of hiding and calls 911, telling police Wortman assaulted her before the killing rampage has several firearms and that he is wearing an authentic RCMP uniform and is driving a replica RCMP vehicle. RCMP say on Twitter the Portapic situation involves an active shooter. Almost an hour later, RCMP release a photo of the gunman on Twitter and say he is considered armed. In times of emergency, information can save lives. On that terrible April weekend when 22 innocent Nova Scotians lost their lives, the RCMP did not issue a province-wide emergency alert. Instead, it communicated with the public on social media. They shared everything over Twitter, which is an absolute piss-off to me and anyone I have a conversation with. Are like, you on Twitter? Abs I don't know anyone that's... Ryan Reynolds is the only one I know on Twitter. Like, nobody I know uses Twitter. In 13 hours, the RCMP tweeted 10 times, relying, it later said, on local media to rebroadcast the tweets. Anyone who did see them would have assumed they were the latest and most complete information the RCMP had. But that wasn't always the case. Remember what the RCMP said about how and when it learned critical details about the gunman. It was at that time 
that through a significant, that significant key witness, we confirm more details about Gabriel Wardman. This included the fact that he was in possession of a fully marked and equipped replica RCMP vehicle and was wearing a police uniform. The RCMP said that information came from Wortman's partner, who didn't emerge from hiding until early Sunday morning. Prior to that time, we did not have all those details. The bulk of the details about our suspect came to us at that time. But we've learned the RCMP did have the very same details at least eight hours earlier from the very first witness it encountered in port pic That man has never been identified publicly. He was driving his car when Wortman shot and injured him. He wouldn't speak to us. But at 10.30 Saturday night, he did speak to an RCMP officer on the scene. I saw Gabe, I saw him, and I saw his gun. He had a laser sight on the gun. In this audio tape obtained by the Fifth Estate, he explains to a private investigator what he told the officer. I think I literally said, I'm not even sure it's my favorite Gabe, and uh, he had an RCMP officer, or RCP car. I knew he had those cars, but I'd never seen them badged. The badges, he said, made it look exactly like a real police cruiser. It was a replica or Sam Beaker. Right away, he grabbed his radio and radioed exactly what I told him. But he did radio that right away to somebody. The RCMP must have believed the man because internal police bulletins show that by 1 a.m. it had identified Wartman as a suspect, linking him to an old white police car. Seven hours later, an update called it a fully marked police car and gave the number. Crucially, it also warned police that Wortman could be anywhere in the province. But that's not what the RCMP was telling the public. At almost the exact same time as that internal bulletin, it put out another tweet, advising that its active shooter investigation was continuing, the danger still confined to port pic Fifty minutes after that, another tweet did identify Wartman, but made no mention of him being anywhere or any of the information we now know the RCMP received the night before. Security cameras would record what looked like an RCMP cruiser on Hunter Road at 6.30 that morning, near the home of Alana Jenkins and Sean McLeod. When the car left three hours later, they would be dead. I mean, do you, do you have any idea why he would have targeted them? Um, maybe because they were happy. Maybe he was jealous, envied them because they had a life that he didn't have. I, I really don't know. That's the only reasoning that I could come up with. Wartman knew Jenkins and McLeod. They were correctional officers, father and stepmother to two girls, 18-year-old Amelia. Everything I know my dad taught me uh, I wouldn't be who I am without him. Like, I grew up going fishing, hunting. Like, he taught me everything. Like, they were really caring, selfless, loving. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> Their house was always welcoming to everybody, so. That house, too, was set ablaze. A neighbor, Tom Bagley, came to investigate and was also killed. A few minutes later, so was Lillian Campbell, out for a morning walk. Hunter Road in Wentworth is about 40 kilometers from the town of DeBert. On Sunday morning, Kristen Beaton was getting ready to head that way for work. She was going to work early in the morning, I, you know, six, seven, whatever time it was. And she came in and she gave me a big kiss and a big hug and she said, babe, you're the best. And little did I know, little did I know that would be the last one I'd have, last kiss I'd have. Even from the road, Kristen was keeping an eye on Facebook. It was just before 10 that she called Nick to say someone had reposted a new RCMP tweet, identifying Gabriel Wartman as the Portapic suspect. Persons who were killed. Compounding the grief are the questions. What did the RCMP know? What did they do to try and stop the killer? 
Could any of the victims have been spared? It all happened so fast that I don't believe anyone could have saved Lisa. I think that what could have saved Lisa is to go back 10 years. In 2002, Gabriel Wartman was convicted of assault. In 2010, he was investigated for threatening his parents. His father says he told police Wartman had guns. In 2011, there was another tip. Municipal police in the town of Truro were told Wartman kept most of his guns at his cottage in port a -Pic. He was starting to have mental issues, according to the tipster, telling people he wanted to kill a cop. So that's a community safety issue and, a, and an officer safety issue. So those are taken very seriously. That's why our officer did uh, record it for the bulletin to be shared with all police agencies in the province. But Truro police didn't have jurisdiction over port a -Pic. The RCMP did. An officer was sent to visit Wartman, the RCMP says, but took no further action. It won't say what it did two years later when it got yet another complaint about Gabriel Wartman and guns. When we first met him, um, it was a little sketchy. Um, he found out that we were military, and uh, he showed myself and my husband all the illegal weapons that he had. And then he asked us if we could get him some weapons and some um, bullets and stuff. And I went, and my husband, both of us said, no, it's illegal, you can't do that. Forbes reported the encounter to the RCMP, as well as information that Wartman was abusing his partner. Did they tell you that they were going to investigate? They said, they didn't say that they were going to investigate. They said they're going to check on it. Um, but they said also that there's probably nothing that we can do. Like, we didn't, I didn't have actual proof proof that the weapons are there, like pictures or whatever. But you had the knowledge. Yeah. You, you had what you yeah. saw. And, and would that not have been enough for them thought. to go and, and knock on the door and I would have thought. check it out? Yep. Nova Scotians have lots of questions about what happened, why it happened, what things were done, and what wasn't. You can be assured that we have those same questions and we'll be seeking answers through our investigation. In seven months, the RCMP has offered few answers. Most of what is known has come from the media taking the RCMP to court to force disclosures as well as from the victims' families who've been conducting their own investigation. Um, it seems to me that the RCMP um, are, are, are not wanting the entire story to come out uh, about how the response to this tragedy um, took place. Why would they not want it to come out? Uh, well, to be frank, it, it's, it seems to be quite embarrassing. Take the RCMP's initial response. It still won't say exactly how many officers were dispatched to port pick that night or when reinforcements arrived. But it insists the first responders were heroes immediately going after the threat. As dictated by their training, their objective was to locate and to stop that threat. This is exactly what those RCMP first responders we're working towards. But a witness we've talked to saw no evidence of that, not until the emergency response team arrived from Halifax, which he says was more than two hours later. The RCMP's initial response consisted of three police cars, according to witnesses, parked at the entrance to port a -Pic. Uh, My understanding is during that time, it was more of a um, secure the scene um, operation rather than a, a uh, boots on the ground, let's, um, you know, let's neutralize the gunman. And it could have saved some more lives. That's certainly how it the looked to others who were there too. Better. I hid in the woods for about four hours, staring up the sky, freezing to death, looking for red flashing lights that never came, that never came. So hours, hours, people were there burning to death and dying. It took hours for a response. That's not right. That's not right at all.
these video images have never been seen publicly until now. The RCMP takedown of the man who killed 22 people over a 13-hour rampage in several Nova Scotia communities. The Mass Casualty Commission originally decided not to release the videos, fearing they might do more harm than good if they were misused on the Internet. The Commission reversed its decision after a challenge by media, in part because no parties objected to their release. The videos show the killer pulling into the Irving Big Stop gas station in Enfield, driving a car he stole from his final victim, Gina Goulet. A member of an RCMP emergency response team noticed him staring straight ahead, recognizing the killer from photos shared earlier that morning. The Mountie and his partner opened fire, shooting multiple times without hesitation, ending the man's life. Evidence released earlier at the public inquiry showed at almost the same time, the gunman shot himself in the head. Goodman's mock police car showed just how precise a replica it was, not just outside. And new evidence shows Gabriel Wortman showed the car off to friends and family, patients at his denture clinic, and many others in the community. He was there on and off quite a bit. This man works at the warehouse where the federal government auctions off items it doesn't need anymore. It's where the gunman bought the car he would turn into the replica. He actually told me that and he actually told my, the girls and the employees at work where I work with, uh, he was building the RCMP car f for parades for the falling down cops. The gunman told people he planned to use the car as a memorial for the Mounties killed in Moncton in 2014. He told others he was using it for a movie he was making about the apocalypse. So the perpetrator ordered a lot of accessories for the cruiser on eBay and on Amazon. Several people questioned the legality of what he was doing, but no one reported the car to police. And that meant officers were scrambling on that terrible night in April 2020. Now it says here, calm saying it was a police car. As soon as those first 911 alerts started coming in, multiple people reported the shooter was driving what looked like a police car.